All right, we've looked at some of the early church fathers. We looked at the Alexandrian and Antiochian schools, the allegorical in Alexandria and the grammatical, rhetorical, historical one in Antioch. Now, we're going to look at some of the later church fathers. These are, you know, we've gone through the apologists, we've gone through the early ones. Here's some of the later ones. And we're going to look at uh, a couple of guys, uh, uh, Jerome, uh, Vincent, Augustine, and uh, John Cassian. And these guys are basically going to establish the patterns of interpretation or sort of solidify some of the patterns of interpretation, really are going to hold sway until the Reformation. Now, I'm not going to say that there aren't variants, but, and there are, and there aren't the other schools or thinking still around. There is, but these, are going to, these guys kind of establish uh, the thinking pattern that is going to follow into the Reformation time period. And guess what? You're going to see a lot of the literal stuff go away. It's going to get much more dominated by tradition and allegory. And those are going to be the two things that are going to come about. I don't think this was their intention, but that's basically what ends up happening. Because these are a lot of the guys that people quote as the church fathers, and that's the traditional view because the church and councils and all that stuff. We've talked about that. But let's look at Jerome first. Jerome, from he lived from around 347 to 458, so lived quite a long time. He was originally a follower of Origen and the Alexandrian school, and he used allegory. Okay. Now, after he dealt with some of the Antiochian people, when he headed in that general direction, and a Jewish teacher, he moved to the literal approach. So it's interesting, Jerome, who is the father of the Latin Vulgate of the Catholic Church that goes to the traditional and more allegorical, actually started allegorical and moves back to a more literal approach. Uh, even with this literal approach, he did see, and again, you got to give him some, some credit here, a deeper meaning. You know, because the scriptures are not just flat. That's the thing you have to be careful about literal. Literal does not mean flat. Literal has the depth and the richness to it. However, sometimes he saw a little too much, and he moved back into some of the allegory. You know, you're trained in it, and you're going to tend to use it if it sort of suits you. And he was probably the preeminent scholar of his day when it came to languages. When he was translating Latin Vulgate, he originally started with a Latin and Septuagint version, and he updated it, but he went actually now back to the Greek and to the Hebrew and then did his translation. The Latin Vulgate took a while before it became the Bible, actually more around eight or 900, so it was quite a while before it became the Bible, and it got manipulated, and, and we've talked about this before, but he was a biblical scholar in the languages, so it was a sharp guy. Not a very nice guy, but he was a sharp guy. Rick, yeah. just a quick question. question. When, you, when you make the comment about flatness for the scriptures, does that mean like a more of a literal wooden approach? Yeah. Where, where you, 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 like Jesus says, I'm the door of, you, you know, where you're yeah, like seeing figures of speech yeah. directly and stuff like that? Well, when, yeah, when you're talking a flat literal, sometimes, sometimes the words carry the meaning that are far richer than just, you know, I am the door. I am the door. Well, one, you've forgotten the you've forgotten the language that's being used, the type of language that's being used, all those kind of richness. But sometimes we just read something in a in a very very flat sense without realizing there's a whole spiritual understanding behind the words. The words in their context and in the, in the whole of Scripture, if they're just pulled out, they can become dead and flat. Okay. And again, that's part of the context. It's part of the background. It's part of the language. That we're using very often people will just quote it says this right here bang and you're like yeah but you missed the whole flow you missed the context you missed the argument yes it does say that but in in context it doesn't just mean that because again people like to pull their their uh, proof text verses out of context to prove something and then say the bible said okay. well the bible said but that's not what the bible meant does that make sense? Yes. It's a woodenness to the language versus a life to the language. So you're talking more context. Yeah, context. To get the best meaning out of the text instead of yeah, not, and, not having context. Yeah, and if you don't have the context and you don't have the background, you don't have the flow, it's very easy to misrepresent what a text is saying. Okay. You can leave it dead, you can leave it flat, 
and therefore you can pull it and use it for something else. It's not trying to make words say what they're not saying, but it's also not taking away from what they are saying. That deadness, that flatness that comes with it. Yes, you can't go beyond what the text is saying. So, you, you, so that that's a that's a that's a subtlety, and that's as we go through this, we'll be looking at those kinds of ideas. Okay, um, Vincent, he dies around four fifty, and he wrote he writes this um, uh, book called the Cominatorium. Cominatorium. Um, in this, he states that the scriptures receive their final exposition in the ancient church. Oh, oh, oh! Now. He probably, he probably was trying to say the church fathers and everybody, we've seen what truth is because they've, they've had the Council of Nicaea and they've, they understand who Christ is and a lot of these debates and are being dealt with. So he's kind of saying we have sort of studied it and, 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 and it's being shown to be true, the final exposition, the, the description. The problem is as soon as you do that, the power of the gospel itself in the writings of the scriptures are now equated or superseded by the writings of the ancient church. And this is where you start finding this traditional view starting to build in. And this is kind of one of those writings which establishes that. So the traditions of the church, councils, etc. begin to equate or reality supersede. So something that probably, I, 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 don't, I haven't read all this stuff. Well, Tertullian was an earlier version. He was trying to fight the heresy, saying the church has this, you heretics can't. And this is kind of a, that one of those, you know, you start a degree off and you end up 10 degrees off as you go down. He's now going, well, the church, we've, you know, we've studied this, we've debated this, we've done this stuff, so what you're going to see, we have. Unfortunately, that means that any error in your exposition, i.e. your commentary is wrong, your counsel made a bad decision, now is over the top of the scriptures. The scriptures are no longer interpreted as scripture. They're interpreted in light of what the church has interpreted them as. And there's the danger. Lots of good stuff. We do the same thing. Good commentaries, but that man is not God. His comment, comment on that text is not God's word. That's his comment on the text. Good stuff usually, but not this text. So we always have to go back and think that. So Vincent kind of started leading in that way. And so the oldest and most held, most common sense view must be the right one. And I don't know about you, but I have made many mistakes. So my oldest, most common sense view <laughs> was usually wrong as I've learned and grown. So this sets up a bit of a danger. Now we get Augustine of Hippo. And he's from 354 to 430, so again, the same, t same time period. And Augustine starts off with a literal interpretation. And that also made some of the Old Testament a little tough for him, because if you don't understand the background and the culture of the Old Testament, some of the Old Testament stuff is really hard to understand. Again, this is where that background, culture, language, all that stuff comes into play. Without it, I mean, read the Old Testament today, it's hard. It doesn't fit with our thinking which should tell you something. It wasn't written in our thinking. Um, but after he hears Ambrose of Milan, and Ambrose is another one of those early church guys, that, really powerful, he quotes uh, 2 Corinthians 3, 6, the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. Okay, that's cool. And then unfortunately, he in, misinterprets what's going on there and says, oh, it must be allegory. So this stuff I'm having difficulty with over here suddenly comes to life over here, and how did I get there? Allegory. So unfortunately, Augustine starts moving more and more and more that way. Uh, so the way he determines whether allegory or literal was to be used was the rule of faith. And so this meant that what the church had taught will tell him whether allegory should be used or not. So he's kind of tying in with Vincent's ideas that what we've interpreted in the past, and if, if the church tells me this is literal, then it's literal, but if it's not, then it's allegory. And so he kind of kind of drifts back and forth between them. So he understands literal is literal, and allegory, maybe there's some deeper meaning. So again, that's that, that floating idea. Now, Augustine does put forth the idea of the analogy of faith 
And this says no scripture is going to be understood contrary to the general tenor of the rest of scripture. So in other words, the truth of scripture is not going to contradict the truth of scripture, which is good. It's not exactly scripture interpreting scripture, but it's very, 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 very similar to it. So the truths of scripture are not going to be contradicted. They're going to flow. They're going to have the same feeling. So if you start coming up with some crazy idea over here that you're not seeing elsewhere, it's probably a crazy idea over here. So you have to kind of watch the flow. It's sort of like the the big picture of of Scripture, the flow, the progress, and all those other kinds of things we've talked about. He also established seven rules for interpretation and established a reason for allegorizing. So he said, okay, here's why I would allegorize. So he sort of had his little rules. And interesting, and you'll see this later on, the, the idea of love as the principle of interpretation. And, and in one sense, you can kind of say, okay, well, yeah, you know, God is love and there's love. But, but if you start using that, and we're going to see later on in modern times, you see love and unity used as a interpretive principle. Well, that's not loving. That's not unifying. Therefore, it can't be good. Like church discipline. Oh, that's not loving or unifying. Eh. Um, he didn't go there, but some of those early seeds start drifting in there. Okay, the last guy is a guy named John Cassian, and he, about the same time of Augustine, uh, 360 to 435, and he was a monk in modern-day Romania, what is today Romania. At that time, it was called Scythia, and he taught there was a fourfold meaning of Scripture. He said there's a historical, there's a tropological, which means a moral sense, the anagogical, that you like, a tropological, anagogical, that's the secret or heavenly meaning, and an allegorical. So you have historical, tropological, moral, anagogical, secret or heavenly, and allegorical. And his this little ditty that I'm going to read to you here basically became famous during the Middle Ages. They kind of picked up on this type of interpretation. And here's what he said. He said, the letter shows us what God and our fathers did. In other words, the historical idea. Allegory shows us where our faith is hid. So there's this deeper meaning behind it. Moral meaning gives us rules of daily life. In other words, here's what we need to do. And anagogy shows us where we need to end our strife. So in other words... You know, we have heaven, and we shouldn't be, we should be not looking at earthly things. We should be looking at heavenly things. So you've got the letter shows what God and, and our fathers did. Allegory shows us where our faith is hid. The moral meaning gives us rules of daily life, and anagogy shows us where we end our strife. Mm. Interesting. This little thing is used very over and over and over and over in the Middle Ages, which we're going to go look at next as sort of a way of understanding scripture. And parts of it are kind of cool. There, there, there are these elements, but that's not interpretive. <laughs> there may be application, there may be perspective, there may be vision, all good ideas, but they're not interpretive. So you have to be careful using a good idea as an interpretive principle. So next we'll look at the Middle Ages up to the Reformation.